I'm so happy to be here at a five o'clock block with Global Connections, and we're connected uh, with Professor uh, Yoichiro Sato uh, with Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University, uh, and he is a specialist in international affairs um, and geopolitics in Asia and elsewhere. And we have so much to talk with him today. Uh, hi, Sato-san, you there? Hello, yes, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sato has been on ThinkTech many times, uh, and we always enjoy seeing him. He's been here, he's been there, and we like catching up with him. We want to do that. So uh, this all came to my attention uh, by PACnet32. PACnet32 is a, um, it's a, it's a code of, a, of an article that Mr. Sato wrote for Pacific Forum, and it appeared on their newsletter. And it was entitled, A Dealmaker Trump Tees Up His Game of Trade War. <laughs> Very provocative title. <laughs> yeah. so, and it was a, you know, I must say, Sato-san, you really know how to write English. You're, you, you know, you know I, I, I was a lawyer practicing for many years, and I was always interested in the quality of English that our associates used. And your English is so precise and so careful and so expressive. Uh, you know, and this article was so well written. Honestly, I must say that I wouldn't always say that, but I say that in this case with you. Uh, so my compliments to you on this article. <laughs> Thank you. In any event, uh, I would like to cover the subject because it's a it's a way of looking at the article covers a way of looking at the relationship between the United States, Trump administration, uh, and China in the context of the trade wars but from the viewpoint of Japan, because Japan is involved. Like it or not, Japan is a comparison. Japan is a beneficiary. Uh, Japan is somebody who is, who is going to have, uh, you know, benefits or disadvantages as a result of what happens in this, tr this trade war, this tariff war. And I wonder if you could give me a handle on, on how it looks from your point of view on the trade war, um, because there are so many views about how this is working, and I really want to hear yours. Sure, yeah. Well, first of all, I think the, so much attention is paid on uh, the bilateral trade war between the United States and China, but uh, in reality, the U.S. is uh, pretty much declaring the trade war everywhere, globally, and the Trump has uh, demanded Canada and Mexico to renegotiate the terms of NAFTA and, and after pulling out from the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP negotiations, the United States and the Trump uh, demanded to start the negotiation on bilateral free trade with Japan. And through those negotiations, the U.S. is trying to get more than it could have under the TPP negotiation or the existing uh, the NAFTA agreement with its trade partners. So there's a uh, very comprehensive campaign to uh, renegotiate or newly negotiate a trade agreement which favors the United States. Mm. So Japan is uh, uh, one of those efforts. Um, so, you know, one thing that strikes me is that uh, Trump is trying to do um, bilateral negotiations instead of multilateral negotiations. He's, he's pulling out of multilateral trade negotiations, trade agreements, and going into bilateral. And I guess it's in the thought mm -hmm. that the United States will do better that way. Um, unfortunately, he's given up some very important multilateral multi, uh, uh, agreements like the, one, the ones with Mexico and Canada and certainly uh, the, uh, the, uh, trade, the Pan Pacific um, uh, uh, multilateral agreement. So the question is, and I think I know the answer from your article, is that realistic? Can he really do better by dropping out of those agreements and coming up with some, you know, bilateral agreements to replace them? Or is that simply um, not going to work. Okay. Uh, I think as far as the trade is concerned, the 
Trump's approach to negotiate bilaterally with individual members of the TPP uh, grouping seems to be uh, working. And, you know, when you look at the, the Japan-US uh, trade negotiation, the US has been very reluctant to open up the, the automobile sector. And one of the primary interests of Japan in entering the, the TPP negotiation was to kind of borrow the collective strength of all TPP members to kind of force the United States to drop the remaining automobile tariff, which is currently at 2.5% uh, on passenger vehicles, which doesn't seem to be too high, but uh, I mean, as a consumers, you know, if you look at the price of the car and 2.5% of that is actually quite significant. And for the Japanese companies, that will be uh, uh, quite important competitive factor to uh, get rid of this tariff. Mm. And the 2.5% is for passenger vehicles, but uh, what's not very well known is that uh, the US categorizes the, the two-door SUVs, those smaller SUVs, under the light truck category, which comes with 25% tariffs. And in order to get Japan agreed to a bilateral negotiation, the Trump actually threatened Japan to raise the passenger vehicle tariff also to 25%. So with that kind of threat, the Japan was brought into, very reluctantly brought into a bilateral negotiation. Mm. Whereas initial hope of Japan was that the United States would return to a multilateral TPP negotiation. Well, you know, I just I wonder that, um, you know, whether this is sustainable in the long term, because, um, you know, an uh, ex country who is involved in the Trans Pacific Partnership um, sees that Trump is dropping out, sees that Trump wants to better his position by um, you know, bilateral negotiations. Um, and, and it may say, I mean, it depends on your bargaining position, but it may say, we're not going to do that. We're going to focus on TPP. We're going to focus on other markets. You know, have a nice day. We're, we're not going to play with you. Uh, and I think that happens. I mean, he forces, he bullies countries into doing that. And over time, it seems to me that if he keeps on doing that, countries will find other markets. And we live in a global economic community, and there are other markets. Could Japan stand that? Or is Japan too dependent on the U.S.? Uh, yes, uh, the trade is not only bilateral, so of course, uh, when the U.S. Uh, act in a protectionist manner, then the trade diversion can occur, and, and Japan is already working on uh, signing free trade agreements or negotiating free trade agreements with other partners. As soon as uh, the Trump put the U.S. out of the TPP negotiation, Japan quickly signed a free trade agreement with the uh, European Union. And also, Japan approached China and South Korea and tried to uh, jumpstart the RCEP negotiation, Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is basically a, a free trade of uh, the three Northeast Asian countries, Japan, uh, Korea, China, plus the ASEAN 10 members. So uh, in that sense, uh, yes, Japan is uh, working on these three projects. One is the East Asian integration free trade. The other one is the East Asia Europe kind of uh, free trade. And then Japan US free trade. Mm. So by leveraging one negotiation against another, Japan is trying to counter uh, Trump's uh, kind of uh, mercantilist offensive. Yeah. yeah, I wonder, as, a, as an observer of this for a long time, <clears throat> um, 
you know, how you feel about a situation where Trump is first uh, trying to uh, bully China, and then next time you look, with all these tariffs that he set up, he started this crisis, this war. The next time you look, he's doing it to Japan. And you know, whatever you want to say is that Japan has been our closest ally by far in all of Asia. It's been our friend. It's been our it's been more than a friend uh, for ever since the war, and we have a, a really exclusive, uh, special relationship with, with Japan as we have with no other country. And here, Trump is going after Japan, too, <clears throat> as if we were not friends. Uh, and I mm -hmm. wonder, you know, I mean, I, I think you already know how I feel about that, but I wonder how you feel about it, uh, seeing him do that. Uh, to undermine and to stress out uh, the relationship we have had with Japan all these years? Well, I think that Trump is really pursuing uh, realist foreign policy, and uh, the rising security tension between uh, China on one hand and Japan on the other is actually uh, uh, providing an opportunity for the U.S. to improve its trade terms with both China and Japan. So in a sense, the U.S. is playing uh, uh, the two parties uh, separately and uh, taking advantage of the rivalry between them. So in other words, if Japan feels a stronger, growing need for security protection from the United States, but Trump thinks that Japan needs to pay a higher due of the alliance and the improving the terms of trade for the United States is uh, considered one of those uh, the dues Japan would have to pay. Ah, that's a very chilling and uncomfortable thought, but I think you've hit on something there. Um, you know, the other aspect is um, that uh, you know, we, we have our relationship with Japan, and this stresses out that relationship. I wonder, you know, how this, how the average citizen in Japan feels about this. And, um, you know, especially uh, in view of Trump's recent trip to Japan, where, uh, and this is reflected in the title of your Pacific Forum show about teeing up, Trump teeing up his game. Because he, he, did, he did a lot of sports with Mr. Abe while he was there. Yeah. And it, it seems inconsistent. On the one hand, you do a lot of sports with Mr. Abe. On the other hand, uh, you get into this bullying mode, um, which, which it just seems oxymoron to me. Uh, what do the people on the street think? Well, uh, I think the most common understanding of the recent uh, the summit meeting was that it was a success and, and that that Mr. Abe uh, successfully entertained Mr. Trump so that uh, Mr. Trump went home happy. And, <laughs> and because Trump didn't mention much about trade during the visit, uh, many people are thinking that uh, the kind of personal relationship which you can see on the me media is working to smoothen the bilateral relationship. <laughs> but uh, I'm arguing in my paper that uh, this is temporary, and the, there was a lot of effort to manage the me media reporting of this particular event on both sides of the Pacific. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you, know, you, you have to watch out when some people get close to you because they don't have good intentions. <laughs> and that's, that's what comes to mind. He may be whining yeah. and dining with Mr. Abe, but he doesn't necessarily have good intentions. Yeah. But one of the, the biggest concessions Trump made is obviously not to raise the trade issues to the front line of the bilateral negotiations <laughs> at this particular timing, because uh, Japan is scheduled to go into an upper house election for the parliament in uh, the end of July, 
Uh, political. Um, yeah. Yes. And uh, the ruling LDP doesn't want to have a trade disputes right before the election, and especially uh, the pressure from the United States to open up the agriculture sector, most importantly the beef market. And so uh, not raising these issues before the election is a favor that Trump uh, gave to Abe. And uh, there's even greater speculation, growing speculation, that uh, Abe is actually planning uh, the double elections by dissolving the lower house of the parliament as well, so that uh, the two elections will concurrently happen this summer. So this is going to be Abe's uh, big gamble because uh, if Abe catches the opposition parties unprepared with uh, dissolution of the lower house and uh, win some additional seats and prepare his party toward uh, the constitutional uh, amendment, then that's going to be Abe's dream come true. And with that kind of victory, the LDP may bend the existing rule about uh, how many terms uh, the Prime Minister can serve and give Abe possibly another term. So this is a big gamble for Abe if he is uh, going to do uh, the double elections. Yeah, maybe it puts him in an interesting spot. Um, we're going to take a short break, Sato-san. Um, and when we come back, I would like to ask you where the G20 meeting fits in all of this and how it will affect the, uh, the U.S. relationship with Japan, if at all. And uh, then I would like to also ask you about the tripartite effect of all of this, because it, nothing in Asia happens in a vacuum. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha. I'm Dennis Wong, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. We're back on Global Connections uh, with Professor Soichiro Sato uh, at Ritsu Macon Asia Pacific University, uh, talking about an article he wrote for Pacific Forum, a dealmaker Trump uh, tees up his game at trade war. Um, and let me take a moment and ask why, why you could style it that way. Um, because, you know, uh, I happen to agree that whatever Mr. Trump does is a game anyway. And there's, a, there's an interesting kind of irony when you, when you uh, title it that way, especially after the trip where they played golf all day. Uh, so yes, yeah. can, you, can you give me the background of the title of your article? Well, I, uh, I wanted to kind of portray him as a negotiator and you know, he, he's known for that through his TV shows and all that. And, and also because of the, the scheduled golf event, I wanted to combine that with the golf analogy. And, <laughs> and thinking that the trade issue was uh, kind of set aside during the meeting, but I could use the key up analogy so that, uh, you know, we see that he has made his preparations already. 
<laughs> it really strikes me. So anyway, going back to the G20, the G20 is in a week or two. It's coming very soon. Um, and uh, this is going to play into things, isn't it? Between U.S. and Japan, U.S. and China. Uh, what, what do you expect will happen and how will it affect the trade war? Well, the U.S. and China are the main focus of uh, the ongoing trade war. And if the talks don't go very well, then there will be a kind of mutual retaliation with the punitive tariffs. And that will slow down not only those two economies, but uh, the other countries' trade with these two countries will also suffer. So, so this is uh, a great concern in both the uh, European Union and in Japan. And they want to uh, make sure that uh, US and China will, will manage the differences and uh, uh, refrain from uh, imposing those extremely high tariffs against each other. Mm. And they wanted to insert uh, this uh, particular language, you know, against uh, protectionism. But, you know, the name in the U.S., a protectionist, is, uh, you know, it's a very diplomatically uh, difficult thing. And most likely, uh, you know, they will pronounce some in general support for the free trade in principle. But uh, naming particular countries or, or using the word protectionist is, uh, is very much a uh, difficult uh, mm. thing to do. So am I right to think that everybody, you know, Japan and uh, I guess Taiwan and, um, and South Korea would all like to see the trade war between the U.S. and China ended because they will benefit from a secession of the hostilities. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, for example, U.S. major imports from China are uh, electronic devices such as uh, smartphones. And if the U.S. raises tariff on these products, what will happen is that uh, the Japanese companies are exporting a lot of components to China for assembling these uh, electronic devices and uh, their export will suffer as a result of the, the U.S. tariffs on the, the final Chinese products. So, uh, so, so this actually uh, relates to you know, what I said earlier that uh, the bilateral trade does not stop at two nations. You know, there are multilateral implications and the Japanese companies will clearly suffer because they have relocated a lot of factories into China and the components produced in those factories end up in the U.S. market in the form of uh, completed, finalized products. Yeah. So, okay, I mean, this is uh, it's interesting, but let me take the other side of it for a moment. Uh, let's let's assume the trade war between the United States and China goes on. Uh, I mean, Trump tends to double down on things. When you know, whenever you'd think he would stop bullying somebody, he keeps on doing it, uh, and, that, and there's a fair chance of that happening. If he doesn't get what he thinks he wants, which may change from time to time, minute to minute, um, then you know he will continue the way you know he has threatened Mexico and other countries. Suppose in our discussion, suppose that happens. Suppose he, he doubles down, he ups the ante, he applies tariffs on more Chinese goods. Um, of course, by your, dif your discussion a moment ago, that, that's not good for Japan or South Korea. Uh, and it may have a negative effect, uh, uh, at least on those countries. What about the implications for global effect? I mean, is, can we say that there is a connection of all of this to the global economy? I think so. The, the European exports to China will also suffer, and uh, the prolonged trade war between the U.S. and China may actually trigger a global economic downturn. But 
having said that, uh, the implications to different countries are not exactly the same. And in the short term, I think uh, China's neighbors, and particularly Vietnam's manufacturing, is likely to benefit from uh, you know, the exodus of foreign companies and their factories from China and relocation into Vietnam. Mm. You can only hope that our State Department, um, you know, will find good policy here, although that hasn't really been the case um, in the past. So this is a very complex, uh, reading your article, I, you know, I got the message that this is very complex. There's a lot of considerations here, a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Japan is in a very peculiar, if not difficult, uh, position because of all the, all the dynamics happening around this trade war. And not only directly with it, with Japan, but also with China and others. Um, and I guess, I guess what I'm asking you here, you know, at the end of our show is, what is your advice to Mr. Abe? How does he stay clear of, you know, of a long-term problem? How does he keep the country, you know, in good economic straits? No one can afford to be involved in a trade war which you don't control and where where actions by other countries involving other countries have secondary effects on you. What, did, what should Mr. Abe do to protect, preserve Japan's economy? Well, for Japan, uh, the number one trade partner for the last uh, 10 years or so has been China. The U.S. used to be Japan's number one export destination and overall trade partner. But uh, the chain has surpassed, uh, and as a result, the Japan has to look at both directions, uh, promoting trade with China and promoting trade with the United States. So this balanced approach has become essential for Japanese economic diplomacy. And uh, Japan has to not only protect the free access into the U.S. market, but uh, the safety of its investments in China, as well as in the United States, and also the freedom, as much freedom for those investors to uh, deal with their uh, proceeds, whether to reinvest or repatriate, and so improving the investment environment in both US and China is extremely important. The one thing Trump recently did is uh, demand Japan to invest more into the U.S. manufacturing sector, mm. and particularly in uh, the automobile sector. Particular uh, the investment target figure has been mentioned, and it's not clear if the, the number Prime Minister Abe mentioned as uh, Japan's pledge to Trump is based on the agreed upon amounts by individual Japanese auto companies or auto component companies, or the figure just came out of Abe in the top, top mm. down manner. If the latter, the Abe is going to have a hard time forcing the domestic companies to reach the target. You know, um, uh, Sato san, it, it occurs to me that. All this, all that we've been talking about in the last 30 minutes um, has the possibility of, of driving Japan economically uh, away from closer relations with the U.S. or previously close relations with the U.S. and driving it essentially into the arms of China so that at the end of the day, uh, Japan's relationship is more intense, more, more connected with China and less with the U.S. That may not bode well for security, but for economics, uh, it, it sounds like an, an option that, or, or a possibility that, that may have legs. What do you think? Is there any chance of that? I think so far, the security issues and uh, economic issues are linked, but uh, the deal with separately, uh, despite uh, the potential for the big problem in the economic sector, uh, in the trade issues, US and Japan on the security front have been working very closely to cement 
their alliance and also elevate Japan's contributions to the security of the United States. The alliance is no longer uh, one directional in which the U.S. was protecting Japan. But now Japan is contributing to the safety and security of the United States as well. So I think that trend on one hand will continue and the two countries will, will have to find a way to manage their economic disputes so that uh, the economic issues will not hurt the security partnership. Mm. Thank you, Sato-san. A wonderful discussion. I really appreciate talking with you. If this goes beyond your article, and I appreciate that too. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope we can get together because, you know, fact is, these are dynamic times. Everything changes every day. There'll be much more to discuss in the future. I will be back to yeah. you shortly, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you.